All right, now let's go ahead and get started. I have our very own motor vehicle tax specialist, Talia Pagaigui, with tax policy as a presenter for today's presentation. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us in today's edition of the Motor Vehicle Tax Talks webinar. Again, my name is Talia Pukaigui. Some of you may be familiar with who I am and may have even spoken to me either on the phone or in person at various tax assessor collector trainings and presentations. I was also at the recent TACA conference in Galveston and part of the roundtable discussions during the conference alongside my colleague, Phil Chai. During those many phone calls and conferences, I have been told that today's webinar topics have been the cause of a lot of confusion. That is one of the reasons why we are covering these specific topics today. So let's begin. Today, we are going to discuss unrepaired salvage vehicles, off-highway, also known as off-road vehicles, and movable specialized equipment. Let's first discuss unrepaired salvage vehicles. An unrepaired salvage vehicle is no longer a motor vehicle for tax purposes because it has been issued a salvage certificate in this state comes into this state under an out-of-state salvage motor vehicle title or similar out-of-state ownership document, or has been declared a total loss by an insurance company. Here is an analogy that may allow you to better understand exactly what to think when dealing with an unrepaired salvage vehicle. Here we have a vehicle that was deemed a total loss by an insurance company. We would equate this unrepaired salvage vehicle with a washing machine. For those of you who remember Kurt Swenson, his favorite saying was that an unrepaired salvage vehicle was a Maytag. So an unrepaired salvage vehicle is equivalent to a Maytag. They are both tangible personal property. Remember, an unrepaired salvage vehicle is tangible personal property subject to limited sales tax under Chapter 151 and not a motor vehicle and not motor vehicle sales tax because it has lost its identity as a motor vehicle. In this example, we have another vehicle that was deemed a total loss by an insurance company. Again, the unrepaired salvage vehicle lost its identity as a motor vehicle when the insurance company deemed it a total loss. So it is now equivalent to a Maytag. The unrepaired salvage vehicle was purchased from a local auction house by Jim, who paid limited sales tax at the time of purchase. Jim then purchased the parts necessary and had a local repair facility perform the labor to repair the vehicle. Jim now has a repaired salvage vehicle and can apply for a Texas certificate of title and or registration. Once Jim is ready to apply for title and or registration, he takes the necessary paperwork to his local county tax assessor collector's office to surrender the salvage vehicle title for a motor vehicle title in his name. No motor vehicle sales tax is due on this transaction because Jim initially paid limited sales tax on the purchase of an unrepaired salvage unit, purchased and paid limited sales tax on the parts and did the repairs himself. The local tax assessor collector's office can request proof of these repairs by way of parts and or repair facility labor invoices if for any reason they have doubts about who performed the repairs. Just remember, the purchaser can perform the labor to repair the vehicles themselves, so invoices showing labor for these repairs may not be available. 
These invoices should show that the purchaser actually paid for the parts and or the labor to repair the vehicle themselves. However, the TAC is not required to verify that limited sales tax was paid on the previously unrepaired salvage vehicle. Let's break down each salvage vehicle transaction so that you can get a better understanding of the different transactions you may encounter. The first transaction we'll discuss in detail is a salvage title to salvage title transaction. When transferring the title of an unrepaired salvage vehicle from salvage title to salvage title, the purchaser bought an unrepaired salvage vehicle, which is tangible personal property. The transaction is subject to limited sales tax, not motor vehicle tax, and the tax assessor collector will not collect motor vehicle sales tax from the purchaser. Let's take a look at an, at an example of this type of transaction. Otto's Auction House sells an unrepaired salvage unit to raise Auto Parts Depot, a licensed salvage dealer who does not have a general distinguishing number or GDN. Ray's Auto Parts Depot gives the auction house form 01-339 Texas Sales and Use Tax Resale Certificate and does not pay limited sales tax because he plans to resell the unrepaired salvage unit. Ray's goes to his local TAC office and transfers the salvage title to a salvage title in their name. The TAC does not collect motor vehicle sales tax on the title transfer. Now let's go through an example of another type of transaction you might see. In this next example, there is a transfer of a salvage title to a rebuilt motor vehicle title. The seller, a licensed salvage dealer who does not have a GDN, sells an unrepaired salvage unit and the purchaser performs the repairs themselves. When transferring the title of a purchaser repaired salvage vehicle from a salvage title to a rebuilt motor vehicle title or blue title, the purchaser presents to their TAC a Texas DMV form VTR61 indicating the purchaser performed the repairs. The purchaser initially bought an unrepaired salvage vehicle, which is tangible personal property subject to limited sales tax, not motor vehicle sales tax. Therefore, the tax assessor collector does not collect motor vehicle sales tax and is not required to verify that limited sales tax was paid on the salvage unit's purchase. Let's go through an example of this transaction. We will use the previous scenario with Ray's Auto Parts Depot, who now has a salvage title in their name. Remember, Ray's Auto Parts Depot is a licensed salvage dealer with no GDN. Ray's has now sold the still unrepaired salvage unit to Debbie. Debbie paid limited sales tax at the time she purchased the unrepaired salvage unit from Ray's because she purchased tangible personal property. Debbie then purchased and paid limited sales tax on the parts necessary and did the labor to repair the unit herself. Debbie then goes into her local TAC office to transfer the salvage title for a rebuilt vehicle title. Again, no motor vehicle sales tax is due on this transaction because Debbie initially purchased the unit as tangible personal property, paid limited sales tax to the licensed salvage dealer, and did the repairs herself. Therefore, no new sale has occurred. Debbie will provide TX DMV form VTR61 to the TAC, showing she performed the repairs to the previously unrepaired salvage unit at the time of titling and registration. 
The next type of salvage vehicle transaction we're going to discuss is the transfer of an already repaired salvage unit, but the seller does not have a GDN. When transferring the title of a seller repaired salvage vehicle from a salvage title to a rebuilt vehicle title or blue title, the purchaser presents TX DMV form VTR 61, indicating the seller performed the repairs. The purchaser bought a repaired vehicle, so now motor vehicle sales tax is due at the time of titling and registration. The TAC will collect motor vehicle sales tax. SPV procedures apply. Let's go back to the example of Debbie's purchase of the unrepaired salvage unit. Debbie still purchased and paid limited sales tax on the parts necessary and performed the repairs to the unit herself. Once the repairs were completed, but before she titled and registered the vehicle in her name, Debbie sold the vehicle to her neighbor, Tom. When Tom goes to the TAC's office to title and register it as a motor vehicle in his name, Tom owes motor vehicle sales tax. The reason Tom owes motor vehicle sales tax is because he purchased a salvage vehicle that had already been repaired. As this is a private party sale transaction, SPV procedures will apply unless the vehicle is over 25 years old. Here is an example of this type of transaction. Tim's trusty salvage vehicles, a licensed salvage dealer, with no GDN, sells a repaired or rebuilt salvage vehicle to Kate. Kate goes to her local TAC's office to title and register the motor vehicle in her name, going from a salvage title to a rebuilt motor vehicle title or blue title. Kate owes motor vehicle sales tax. SPV procedures will apply unless the vehicle is over 25 years old. Again, the reason SPV procedures apply is because Kate purchased an already repaired salvage vehicle from a dealer who only holds a salvage dealer license and not a GDN. So remember, when an individual purchases an already repaired salvage vehicle from a seller who does not have a GDN and they go to their TAC to title and register the motor vehicle in their name for a rebuilt motor vehicle title, motor vehicle sales tax is due on the SPV of the vehicle. SPV procedures apply because the vehicle was sold by a seller who is not a GDN dealer. Moving on to the last type of transaction you might see, we are now going to discuss the transfer of a salvage title to a rebuilt motor vehicle title when the seller is a GDN dealer. When transferring the title of a repaired salvage vehicle from a salvage title to a motor vehicle title or blue title with a rebuilt remark, the selling dealer presents TX DMV form VTR 61, indicating the seller performed the repairs. The purchaser bought a repaired vehicle, therefore motor vehicle sales tax is due. The GDN dealer will collect and remit motor vehicle sales tax based on the sales price to the TAC at the time of title transfer. If from our previous example, Tim's trusty salvage vehicles had both a salvage dealer license and a GDN, Tim's trusty salvage vehicles would be responsible for collecting motor vehicle sales tax on the sales price from Kate at the time of the sale in order for the dealer to submit the title paperwork to the TAC. Once again, when sold by a dealer who holds a GDN, 
motor vehicle sales taxes is calculated on the sales price of the motor vehicle and not on the SPV. Only when a dealer has a GDN are they responsible for the collection of motor vehicle sales tax at the time of sale. And since SPV does not apply to dealer sales, tax is due on the sales price. Now let's move on to the next topic of today's webinar, off-highway vehicles. Recreational off-highway vehicles are subject to tax under Chapter 151, Limited Sales and Use Tax. We define off-highway vehicles as designed by the manufacturer for off-highway use by the operator only and not designed by the manufacturer primarily for farming or lawn care. House Bill 1543, which became effective September 1st, 2019, states that taxpayers who purchase a new off-highway vehicle out of state must present proof of Texas use tax paid to the comptroller's office upon submitting an application for title and or registration to a TAC after March 1st, 2020. If proof of Texas use tax paid is not provided for new off-highway vehicles titled after March 1st, 2020, the application for title should be rejected until proof of tax paid is provided. Our office is currently working on a process to comply with House Bill 1543 by meeting with agencies and associations affected by this bill, including local county tax assessor collector offices. We will provide additional information as these processes are implemented. Now let's take a look at our last topic for today's webinar. Movable Specialized Equipment, also referred to by the acronym MSE. MSE is, divine, is defined in Texas Motor Vehicle Sales Tax Rule 3.88 as a unit designed and built specifically to perform a specialized function and which does not include transporting property separate from itself or persons other than the driver. Let's view some examples of movable specialized equipment meeting these criteria. Here we have a motorized crane a motorized oil well servicing unit, and a mobile auto crusher. Other examples of movable specialized equipment include a portable light tower, a towable elevating work platform, also known as a cherry picker, and a towable backhoe. At times you may still find yourself asking, how do I know for sure that it's movable specialized equipment and not a motor vehicle? Well, one of the most important things to remember when determining whether you are dealing with movable specialized equipment or a motor vehicle is the unit's original design function. In essence, what its intended purpose was when it was built by the manufacturer. Most importantly, you must remember that a unit which meets the definition of a motor vehicle does not lose its identity as a motor vehicle just because tangible personal property is added to the vehicle, allowing it to perform a specific function while prohibiting the vehicle from transporting separate property or persons. Let's take a look at a couple of examples of motor vehicles that retain their identities as motor vehicles and are not movable specialized equipment. Here we have two oil field service trucks. Modifications were done on the vehicle's chassis. However, 
these units do not lose their identities as motor vehicles because of the initial manufacturing of the cab and chassis. Let's break this down even further. In this example, I purchase a motor vehicle cab and chassis from a local dealership. I want to modify it by adding oil field servicing equipment to the chassis of the vehicle. The resulting modification does not change the fact that the original purpose of the unit is to carry tangible personal property separate from itself and other people besides the driver. Therefore, it remains a motor vehicle. Now comes the exciting, but hopefully not too intense part of the webinar. In the next few slides, we want to test your knowledge and see if you can determine the difference between movable specialized equipment and a motor vehicle. For this exercise, I will ask for assistance from our moderator, Jessica. Hello again, everyone. Okay, so be sure to put your thinking caps on. Are you ready? Great. Here's the first example. This is a towable auger or earth digger. Talia, is this a movable specialized equipment or would you say a motor vehicle? This is movable specialized equipment, Jessica. This unit was designed to perform a specific function, drilling holes in the ground and was not designed to transport property. That is correct. And if, if any of you also said MSE, you are correct. Great job. Okay, our next example is a cab with a modified chassis that only includes a cube feeder. Hmm. Well, Talia, can this be a movable specialized equipment or a motor vehicle? I'll take what is a motor vehicle for $100, Jessica. <laughs> okay, I see that was a little bit of a game show reference there, but the answer is yes, motor vehicle. This vehicle was designed specifically to transport separate property and a passenger other than the driver. Okay, next one. So here we have a towable trash pump. Hmm, Ms. Pogagui. Is this a movable specialized equipment or a motor vehicle? Hey, hey now. Miss Pakaigui is what my mom's students used to call her and she's probably at home right now enjoying the retired teacher life. However, the answer you're looking for, Jessica, is movable specialized equipment. This unit was designed to perform a specific function, pumping contaminated and abrasive fluids and was not designed to transport separate property. <laughs> okay, I should recall you by your first name or I should say your nickname. <laughs> but yes, you are right. If you said movable specialized equipment, you are correct. Okay, next we have a towable dump trailer. Looks easy enough to answer, but let's see if you can get this one right. So Talia, what do you say? Movable specialized equipment or a motor vehicle? This is most definitely a motor vehicle. This unit was designed specifically to transport separate property. Of course, this is a motor vehicle. And I'm certain every one of you said motor vehicle as well, right? Okay, ooh, this one looks interesting. This is an example of a mobile auto crusher. Sounds intimidating. So Talia, what do you say? What is this? Hmm. Well, looking at its design and function, I'm going to say movable specialized equipment, and that's my final answer. This unit was built specifically to crush automobiles and meets the definition of movable specialized equipment. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> yes, and you are correct again. Movable specialized equipment is right. Okay, on to our next example. This is a cab with a modified chassis that only includes a hay barrel spikes. So what is this, Talia? Well, since it only has hay bale spikes and there isn't a cube feeder and hay bale rollout distribution device that takes up 100% of the flatbed of the vehicle, 
I know for sure that this is a motor vehicle. Well, look at you, you're on a row. <laughs> so yes, the answer is a motor vehicle. This vehicle was designed specifically to transport separate property and a passenger other than a driver. I hope all of you got the same answer. Okay, ooh, what's this? Another great example I see. Okay, so I've heard these units have been the cause of a lot of confusion. This is a trailer jockey, also known as a yard dog. So Talia, what do you say? Well, Jessica, since this unit has been the cause of a lot of confusion, I'd like to explain this unit's features before giving my answer. Maybe it'll help everyone understand why the answer is what it is. This unit was designed and built to perform a specific function. It was also not designed to be driven on public highways. Therefore, my answer is movable specialized equipment. You are correct. This unit is built to perform a, a specific function and not designed for, for use on public highways. So you are correct. This is movable specialized equipment. Okay, hmm. well, what do we have here? This is a portable water truck. This one looks like it might be another tricky one. So Talia, what do you have to say about this one? This one can seem a little tricky, but if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. This is a motor vehicle. This vehicle was designed specifically to transport water, which is tangible personal property and a passenger other than the driver. Motor vehicle, you say? Hmm, looks like you are correct. <laughs> I had to give you some of a dramatic, you know, little pause there, but yes, you did good. You got this one correct. Okay, so you're all, we're almost at the end of our little quiz, but just a couple more questions to go. Here's an example of a frack tank. So Talia, for you buying lunch today, is this a movable specialized equipment or a motor vehicle? Let's see, I need to be really careful with this one since lunch is on the line. <laughs> frack tanks are used in the oil and gas industry and have a specialized function. They are designed to hold water that is pressurized and sent down into a well bore when a new well is formed and was not designed to transport separate property. Therefore, Jessica, my answer is that this is movable specialized equipment. Ah, yes, you are, and once again, correct. This is movable specialized equipment. So far, you're a nine for nine. Let's see if we can make it 10 for 10 with our last example. Okay, Talia. Here we go. This unit distributes feed on a ranch. Is this movable specialized equipment or would you say a motor vehicle? <laughs> I see what you did there. This was actually a little bit of a trick question. The correct answer is neither. This unit is neither movable specialized equipment nor a motor vehicle. This vehicle actually meets the definition of a farm machine and was designed specifically to distribute feed and is primarily used on a ranch. Therefore, it is not subject to tax. You're correct. Now, since you've said this, can you provide a little more information about farm machines for our audience? I'll be more than happy to, Jessica. Here is some bonus information for y'all since we're on the subject of farm machines. A unit is exempt from tax under chapter 152, motor vehicle sales and use tax, if it meets the definition of a farm machine, meaning it is a self-propelled vehicle, specially adapted and primarily used for distributing and applying plant food materials or agricultural chemicals for the production of crops or distributing feed for livestock, including poultry in feedlots. Farm machines include, but are not limited to, a truck, cab, and chassis with a tank and equipment designed to apply liquid fertilizer, a truck, cab, and chassis with a hopper and auger designed to distribute feed in a feedlot, and a truck modified with a flatbed feed distributor and a hay bale rollout distribution device. 
Here are some examples of, this, of units that qualify as farm machines. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this ends my portion of today's webinar presentation. Well, I hope that the examples we've provided help you to better understand unrepaired salvage vehicles, off-highway vehicles, movable specialized equipment, and with the addition of the bonus information, farm machines. You should now all be experts on these motor vehicle topics. You can answer all our, I'm sorry, you can access all our resources on our website at comptroller.texas.gov. If you have any additional questions, please send us an email at tax.help at cpa.texas.gov.